For centuries, this has been viewed by outsiders as one of the most dangerous places in the world. 150 years ago, against popular advice, one man came to explore this forbidden land. I'm about to embark on that same journey, the first person to ever retrace his footsteps. It was in December of 1854 that the controversial British explorer, Captain Sir Richard Burton, crossed these plains. Behind him lay the port city of Zela at the mouth of the Red Sea, and ahead of him lay the Muslim citadel of Hara, set in the Ethiopian highlands some 200 miles from here. The rulers of Hara, a family of emirs, believed that if an infidel were to penetrate the city, both they and the population would be doomed. Therefore, any non-believer who entered the city was put to death. Burton was a maverick and one of the most audacious explorers of the Victorian era who scandalised English society, not least with his translations of Eastern erotica. But he also wrote 43 books, spoke 40 languages, was a scholar of Oriental religion and culture, as well as being an accomplished swordsman. He was also a pioneering anthropologist who totally immersed himself in whatever culture he was studying. One of his trademarks was the use of disguises, and it was in local dress that he gained unique access to Mecca and Medina. On his return, he took the title of Haji Abdullah, the disguise he adopted for this dangerous expedition to Hara. It is a point of honor with me to utilize my title of Haji by entering the city, visiting the ruler, and returning in safety after breaking the guardian spell. Towards the end of November, 1854, four camels were procured, an aban was engaged, we hired two women cooks and a fourth servant. Sandals were cut out for walking, palavas were held, and affairs began to wear the semblance of departure. Unknown Hara lies, according to my dead reckoning, 220 degrees southwest of, and 175 statute miles from Zela. Ragi, a petty Issa chief, warned us seriously to prepare for dangers and disasters, and this seemed to be the general opinion of Zela, whose timid citizens determined that we were tired of our lives. <laughs> My family involvement with the Somali people began in 1938 when my father first visited the region. And for the past 14 years, I've spent much of my life amongst the Somalis, both in times of peace and war. However, of course, it was Burton who was the first European to actually travel extensively in the Somali region. And he wrote wonderfully of the people and places that he encountered. And it is these writings which have inspired me to make this journey. Burton described very precisely the journey that he made. And working from his writings, I'm going to follow as faithfully as possible the route that he took. The first part of my journey takes me along the hot coastal plains. Then I'll be turning inland and following one of the many dry riverbeds up to the first range of mountains at Jif. From there, I cross what Burton called the Mara Plain, a vast high-level plateau that leads me into the Ethiopian highlands proper and eventually to Hara itself. The Somal reckon their journeys by the Gedi, or march, which varies from four to five hours. They begin before dawn and halt at about 11 a.m., the time of the morning meal. 
When a second march is made, they load at 3 p.m. and advance till dark. Thus, 15 miles would be the average of fast traveling. Well, that's about enough for one morning. The sun's about overhead and we've been walking about four hours and the camels need to eat. And I think probably we need to brew some tea as well. Looks like we lost the lid of the kettle. Somebody forgot to tie the lid on, so um, it's going to take a bit longer to boil the tea there. One of the reasons Burton's trip was so successful is that he completely understood and used the Somali clan system. A clan is basically uh, the same as you have in Scotland. It's an extended family with all members of that group claiming common descent from a single forefather. Osman here, my friend and companion, is a member of the Isa clan, who are the people who inhabit this particular region. And it was from this clan that Burton also took his guide and companion. Now, apart from being my friend, Osman is also very useful. He is what we call an aban. And an aban is a, like a guarantor for the journey. So long as Osman is with me, he provides me with temporary membership of his clan and all the protection that that can offer. So he's a very important person. The Somali region was actually one of the first places where domestic camels were introduced. And to this day, there are more camels in the Somali region than anywhere else on earth. They only ever ride them if they're sick. And they only load them relatively lightly. And it's for their milk that Somalis really prize their camels. It was in 1985 that I first really got hands-on experience of how to, to use camels. And it was when I was effectively an apprentice camel boy for three or four months that I had to learn not only about how to graze camels, but also how to load them and to, to live with them. As a photographer, I've always carried a camera. And over my 14-year involvement with the region, I've built up a unique archive of Somali culture and history. Not only did I live as a nomad for many years, but I also fought in the War of Liberation, which overthrew the dictator Mohamed Sir Bari. And I was present when the northwest of Somalia declared itself the independent Republic of Somaliland. On many occasions, in fact most of these occasions, I was, like Burton, the only European present. <laughs> to men gifted with any imaginative powers, the anticipation must ever be worse than the event. Thus it happens that he who feels a thrill of fear before engaging in a peril exchanges it for a throb of exultation when he finds himself hand to hand with the danger. This is breakfast. Last night's supper. You didn't get much sleep in the early part of the evening. There was the most enormous argument. It was actually quite spectacular. It started with just um, our camel people and our guide and some of the people from this uh, rare, this camp. And it ended up with reinforcements from both sides coming from over the hills until there were about 30 people. And the problem was this area is divided into two sub-sub-sub-clans. And we quite rightly insisted on having two camel men from each side. And um, as far as we knew, we had actually got two people from each side. Now, up until now, we've been traveling on the other side. Um, and today, we shifted over to the, to the second part of the, of the journey. And it then emerged that, in fact, we only had um, four people from the first group and none from the second group. So therefore, the people from this group got angry 
uh, that they were not being represented. And um, so the argument ensued, and we're now effectively stuck. We can't move on until this argument is solved. And it's very typical of the sort of problems that Burton faced on an almost daily basis. And it's just part of travelling in this area. And we just sit down, uh, we're, we're totally blameless, and we let them discuss it. What we're seeing here is Somali freedom of speech at work, the right of every adult male to express their opinion on the subject. But unfortunately for us, the process takes time. The problem here has been caused by one specific elder. Elders hold office on the basis of merit, and if they fail in their duties, they can be ignominiously dismissed. And that is what the clan have decided to do with Musa. The mistake was that Musa did it. I think uh, he did uh, other mistakes before us. Yeah, yeah. Similar to this one. Yeah. Anyway, he was blamed. Right, right. And now you can proceed. I see. But on the way, yeah. the sub elder of this area, yeah. Daher, Daher uh -huh. we have to keep him. Yeah, yeah. And I told That's him that good. this afternoon we'll reach his we will reach his family. He's a, he's a rare. He, yeah, he's rare and he accepted. Uh -huh. He's accepted and uh -huh. even he said, I will follow you up to some distance. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. That's uh -huh. it. That's the Very story. Good. That's Very the story. Good. So everything is Everything finished. now is clear. <laughs> everything is finished. The land belongs to the Isa. How these Kurajog, or sun dwellers, can exist here in summer is a mystery. My arms were peeled even in the month of December, and my companions, panting with heat, poured forth reproaches upon the rising sun. <laughs> After a brisk morning's walk of about 12 miles, we're in sight of Dahir's camp. In fact, this type of nomadic life has probably changed little since Burton's day. So how many wives does he got? Only one he has. <laughs> Only one. No that's wife. enough, that's enough. Uh, <laughs> More than one is trouble. <laughs> and the, the camels are well? Uh, ah, they're very good. All the camels are good. Yeah. Now, in so many areas of, of the Somali region now, do not find a tent like that. Because they are using plastic and oh, canvas. Yeah, yeah. But you see here how the house and yeah, very all original. of the, the materials. Very original, yeah. It's yeah. good to see, eh? The Issa in particular pride themselves on their hospitality. Burton talks extensively of receiving food and a uh, place to sleep, and the situation is no different today. And it's a matter of honor that when nightfall comes, if a traveler is in the vicinity, that a, a family, a rare, is obliged to offer them uh, a place to sleep and something to eat. And in fact, Many Somali nomads believe that if a traveller passes them by without stopping as nightfall comes, then it will, be a, it will besmirch their name. And that's a, a wonderful code of ethics. It means people can travel freely without having to, to and, take with them anything. The only thing necessary that you can carry is a wezu. Yeah, water Just bottle, water, water, bottle. water container. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. But one of the conditions for that hospitality is that you bring news. Because, that is true, that's <laughs> because true. for Somalis, news is food. That's true, that's and without news, mm, without information, news. Yeah, yeah. Somalis cannot yes, survive. Yes, yes, that's so true. If you speak to any Somali in the bush here, he will have an opinion about Bill Clinton or <laughs> Tony Blair. Yeah, that is yeah. it. Yeah. And Burton was absolutely amazed to find deep in the interior of Somalia <laughs> that the Somalis knew about the Crimean yes, War yes. and they knew about incidents that he had not heard about. Yeah. 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 The headman inquires what is the news. The informant would communicate the important fact that he has been to the well. 
It is good news if Allah please. Wasida, even so, respond the listeners, intoning or rather groaning the response. I mounted mule this morning, even so. I departed from ye riding, even so. There, with a scream and pointing out the direction with a stick, even so. There, I went, even so. I feared nothing, even so. At last I came upon cattle tracks. Hoo, hoo, hoo. An ominous pause follows this exclamation of astonishment. They were fresh, even so. At last I saw sticks, even so. Stones, even so. Water, even so. A well. Then follows the palaver, wherein he distinguishes himself who can rivet the attention of the audience for at least an hour without saying anything in particular. This is the original Somali welcome. Camel's milk is a symbol of peace and prosperity and friendship and everything that is good and healthy about a Somali society. But when you arrive in someone's camp, in the evening they immediately bring you this gorof, this milking vessel full of camel's milk. And no greater welcome could you expect or appreciate. And as you can see, it's literally this minute being milked. It's still got a good head of froth on it. Yeah. And that is, that, that is, as Osman says, the ice cream. And you yeah, see it's yeah. already smeared yeah. around his moustache. Yeah. Yeah. I like that ice cream. Mm. Give me this one. And now I've got it on my nose as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a full of food in itself. For 10 days, I've lived on camel's milk alone, just wondering. And it, it gives you everything you need. It's, it's very satisfying milk. And it is the nutritional staple of the, of the Somali nomad. Oh, so I, fi I finish in my screen. Yes, you see, the, here's, here is an addict. The arrival of guests in any pastoral community is bound to create interest and will draw people from all over the area. The Issa are renowned for their dances, and this one, in fact, is one of their famous war dances. <laughs> Travelling among the Bedouin, I found them kind and hospitable. A pinch of snuff or a handful of tobacco sufficed to win every heart. I was petted like a child, forced to drink milk and to eat mutton. Girls were offered to me in marriage. The people begged me to settle amongst them to head their predatory expeditions, free them from lions, and kill their elephants. After a long, slow climb, we've left the hot, humid, dusty coast, which was really starting to get to us, those endless plains. And we've arrived in the mountains, and the people are just uplifted by the clean air. There's a cool breeze. Uh, the boys have been singing. It's just absolutely superb. And you'll probably also notice we've got different camels. Um, we picked up another four camels, another four men, uh, just at the bottom of the mountains, where we entered a different clan territory. At 1 p.m. we unloaded under a sycamore tree called after a chieftain, Halimali, and giving its name to the surrounding valley. This ancient of the forest is more than half decayed. Several huge limbs lie stretched upon the ground, whence for reverence no one removes them. 
This holy tree was, according to the Samal, a place of prayer for the infidel, and its ancient honors are not departed, as everyone who passes by visits the Halimali tree. Foraging parties frequently meet, and the traveler wends his way in fear and trembling. This tree is obviously not old enough to be the ancient that Burton described. I discovered that in fact it is actually a seedling of a much older tree that was struck by lightning a few years ago. The feasters resembled Wordsworth's cows, 40 feeding like one. In the left hand, they held the meat to their teeth and cut off the slice in possession with long daggers perilously close, where their noses longer and their mouths less obtrusive. The Somali measures manhood by appetite. A son of the Somal is taught as soon as his teeth are cut to devour two pounds of the toughest mutton and ask for more. If his powers of deglutition fail, he is derided as degenerate. Elm has eaten more than his own weight in goat. He's a typical Somali, meat and milk. Meat and milk, No rice. No rice. For Somalis, poetry such as this is not merely a means of artistic expression, it's also a way that they immortalize events and pass social comment. One hundred and thirty five miles and twenty seven days from Zela, Burton reached the Mara Plain, a waterless high plateau plagued with giant dust devils and mirages. It was a place that nearly killed him. Our toil was rendered doubly toilsome by the eastern traveler's dread, the demon of thirst. For 24 hours we did not taste water. The sun parched our brains, the mirage mocked us at every turn, and the effect was a species of monomania. As I jogged along with eyes closed against the fiery air, no image unconnected with the want suggested itself. Water ever lay before me. Water lying deep in the shady well. Water in streams bubbling icy from the rock. Water in pellucid lakes inviting me to plunge and revel in their treasures. Then an invisible hand offered a bowl for which the mortal part would gladly have bartered years of life. Then, drear contrast, I opened my eyes to the heat-reeking plain and a sky of that eternal metallic blue, so lovely to painter and poet, so blank and death-like to us. I tried to talk, it was in vain, to sing, in vain, vainly to think. Every idea was bound up in one subject. Well, that was the end of one of the most desolate and hardest parts of the journey. And it's also the point at which I leave my camels and my Somalis, because now I'm entering the foothills of the Ethiopian highlands. And in this rough terrain, camels are no good at all. And it's far better to proceed just on foot. Burton also left the majority of his caravan here because such was the fear that the locals had of the rulers of Hara that only two Somalis could be persuaded to accompany him on the final leg of his journey.
So there it is at last, the walled city of Hara. And it doesn't look entirely dissimilar to the picture that Burton drew from this very spot. This was a place that he called the Coffee Stream and was a river that he rested beside before he finally entered Hara itself. About two miles distant on the crest of a hill stood the city, the end of my present travel. The spectacle, materially speaking, was a disappointment. Many would have grudged exposing three lives to win so paltry a prize. But of all that have attempted, none have ever succeeded in entering that pile of stones. Advancing to the gate, we accosted a warder and sent our salams to the Emir, saying that we came from Aden and requested the honor of audience. Whilst he sped upon his errand, we were scrutinized, derided, and catechized by the curious of both sexes, especially by that conventionally termed the fair. Three Habaul presently approached and scowlingly inquired why we had not apprised them of our intention to enter the city. It was now war to the knife. The Habar Aul were a Somali clan Burton had been advised to avoid. But here they could only threaten him, as they had no authority to stop him entering the city. In fact, despite the rigors of reaching Hara, Burton actually entered the walled city with relative ease. But the challenge he now faced was to achieve what others had failed to do, which was to escape the clutches of the Emir and return safely to the coast. Hara is an ancient walled city which was founded on some of the oldest trade routes in the whole of Africa. Although small, Hara has a strong sense of its own identity. It has its own language, culture, music and cuisine. But its greatest importance was as a center of Islam. It was one of the first places in the world to receive Islam and thereafter was a center for missionary activity throughout Africa. And within its walls, there are more than 80 mosques. Assalamu alaikum. Well, this is one of the original palaces of the emirs of Hara. And Safir and her family here are descendants of some of the emirs. However, it's not the palace in which Burton was received by the emir who was ruling when he visited. It's possibly the second palace in which he was given a room during his stay here. The interior of our new house was a clean room with plain walls and a floor of tamped earth. Opposite the entrance were two broad steps of masonry raised about two feet and covered with hard matting. I lay down to rest worn out with fatigue and profoundly impressed with the poesy of our position. I was under the roof of a bigoted prince whose least word was death, amongst a people who detest foreigners, the only European that had ever passed their inhospitable threshold. <laughs> This is Gay Humburti, literally the navel or belly button of Hara. It is the geographical and spiritual center of the city and is a place that Burton visited on many occasions. He came here to see his friend, the Somali Sheikh Jama, who was influential with the Emir and helped him in his negotiations. In fact, Burton had already dropped his Arab disguise just prior to entering the city and in a bold move had forged a letter introducing himself as a British envoy. The Emir knew that the British controlled the sea around the Somali ports upon which Hara's business depended, and if he harmed their ambassador, they could readily cut his trade routes. He was also aware of Britain's increasing influence in the region and that it would be foolish to antagonize them. These concerns and Burton's powers of persuasion and strength of character were certainly instrumental in saving his life. But whilst the Emir pondered his fate, Burton was allowed to roam the city. One of the reasons that Hara retains this sense of vibrancy about it is that, as in Burton's day, 
there is still a very strong connection between the rural community that lives in the villages surrounding the city and the city itself. Every day the peasants come with their produce to sell to the townspeople. And it's that ebb and flow of people coming in the morning and returning to the villages in the evening which gives the, the city this sense of, uh, of, of movement, the sense of breathing. I've come to this rather bizarre house to see Jalal Abdul Latif, an Islamic scholar and political activist who was exiled for 24 years. He's also a proud citizen of Hara. It was the curse that uh, the emirs of Hara believed would fall upon the city, which, uh, if an infidel was to penetrate its gates, which mostly drew Burton. I mean, Burton was, was challenged by this. By entering uh, Hara and leaving successfully, did he, in fact, invoke that curse? No one was allowed to come in here. So Richard Burton came. That introduced Hara to the rest of the world. I mean, in 10 days, he produced 50-page dictionary of Harar mm. language. Mm. He met the Amir, he, he walked around the alleys, he tested the food, uh, he did some uh, paintings, uh, he prayed in a mosque. I mean, he, he did everything that he wanted to do, but left in 10 days. Uh, but people feel strongly that since he left, what he published, they feel it was so it was most of political military intelligence. Uh, it actually made Harar vulnerable because of his information, because no one has any information on Harar for hundreds of years. So you mean that Burton, in, in, in effect, was a spy uh, inadvertently for, for the Egyptians? What he wrote in probably the Egyptians the Turks used to come to defeat Harar, or to occupy Harar, definitely. I mean, you can see that linkage. The city may contain 30 horses, they are miserable ponies. Cannon of small caliber is supposed to be concealed in the palace, but none probably knows their use. The approaches to the city are difficult and dangerous, but it is commanded from the north and the west, and the walls would crumble at the touch of a six-pounder. 300 Arabs and two galloper guns would take Hara in an hour. A decade later, Hara fell to the Egyptians. The Emir's curse had come true. Burton wrote extensively about Hara, as he did all aspects of his journey. But at times, he was fairly derogatory about the Hara people. He was not really generous uh, at, at some time. He was very dismissive. I think, I mean, I, this is my own interpretation, I feel he must have a mixed feelings after he came and looked at This is a place that every the whole world's explorers jewel to find and he did it suddenly it's so small <laughs> compared to probably what he knew and so uh maybe it fell his expectation the city is a paradise inhabited by asses certainly the exterior of the people is highly unprepossessing amongst the men i did not see a handsome face their features are coarse and debauched Many of them squint. Others have lost an eye by smallpox, and they are disfigured by scrofula and other diseases. The women appear beautiful by contrast with their lords. They have small heads, regular profiles, straight noses, large eyes, and mouths approaching the Caucasian type. Dress, however, here is a disguise to charms. <laughs> No one's quite sure how this bizarre spectacle began, but every evening, just outside the city walls, a man comes to feed scraps to the hyenas. I've never seen such fat, well-fed hyenas in my life. It's a great turnaround from Burton's time, when he described with approval how the citizens of Hara enticed hyenas into the confines of the walls so that they might spear them to death. And I have to say, I'm more in favour of the practice then than now, especially as hyenas took one of my best camels not so long ago. 
However, this is not the only thing about Hara which has changed. For the first time in ages, Hara people are back in charge of their city and it's enjoying a revival of its cultural identity, its religious identity, and also its commercialism. Again, Hara people are looking to commerce as the center of its wealth and the center of its prosperity. And so in many ways, everything has turned full circle. <laughs> Before I leave Hara, Jalal has invited me to meet his family and try some of the traditional Harari food. Try it a little bit, you have to put some coffee beans on it. Mm. Yes. These are coffee beans which have been roasted and prepared in a local type of butter. I'm going to make a complete mess of this and I'm going to make a sandwich. It's, it's a very, very uh, rich cuisine that they have. Mm. Yes, it's completely, yeah. completely in contrast to the Somalis. What do they and have in Somalia? <laughs> camel's milk, that's the best thing they can have. But they, the Somalis don't uh, attach a great deal of importance to food. It's, it's a very utilitarian uh, exercise, uh, eating. And uh, they boil their meat and they, they cook rice and that's it. But um, apart from the camel's milk, it's, it's sustaining, but not uh, particularly they, tasty. They sound like societies in a hurry. I mean... Cuisines for me take long hours. <coughs> Somebody should have to have time to cook. Mm. I mean, the cooking here takes two, three hours. So it must be Somalis in a hurry all the time. Well, it's a sign of a very well-established civilization, really, isn't it? <laughs> Probably one way looking at it. Yeah. Yes. Well, let's try the coffee. Mm. Good? Mm. 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 Yeah, it's lovely. It's very, very tasty. And not at all how you'd expect it. It's not as harsh as you, you would uh, No, no, it's a soft bean, actually. Yeah. Very soft bean, and these are local beans, aren't they? Local beans around, uh, around the farm here. Yeah. Yeah. But that must be becoming a problem because Burton commented on how, as he entered Hara, hmm. he passed through fields of coffee. But today, um, <coughs> it's mostly fields of, uh, of chat, of, of cut instead. Well, um, chat has totally replaced all other plants as a cash crop. Hmm. This area is a main supplier of high-quality chad. Mm. Chad, if you remember, Burton says, Aklal Salihin. Chad is not supposed to be used by everybody to get high or stimulant. But it was used to be for... The food of the pious. Yes, the food of the pious. Aklal Salihin means chad was Aklal Salihin. Burton would never have recognized these hills and farms surrounding Hara. In his day, they were full of coffee bushes, the product for which Hara was most famous. But today, the coffee has totally disappeared, and in its place are these plantations of cut. Cut is largely used as a pleasurable excitant. It is generally imported in small camel loads, consisting of a number of parcels, each containing about 40 slender twigs with the leaves attached, and carefully wrapped so as to prevent as much as possible exposure to the atmosphere. The leaves form the edible part, and these, when chewed, are said to produce great hilarity of spirits and an agreeable state of wakefulness. Unlike in Burton's day, when the chewing of cut was the preserve of the learned, like these holy men, today it is widely chewed by all age groups, and its use amounts to abuse. <laughs> The use of khat is embedded in Harari culture. For instance, a groom will present kusha chat to his bride's family as a mark of respect. And at a wedding such as this, which will last for seven days, the chewing of khat is an important part of the ceremonies.
Today, Qat is big business, and Hara has become something of a drugs capital, existing not only throughout East Africa, but also to other parts of the world. From the moment Qat is picked, the race is on to get it to the market. This is because its potency decreases with age, and so it's sorted, bundled, and packed onto trucks to be driven at great speed across the country as quickly as possible. And it's on one of these trucks that I've arranged to get a lift back into Somaliland. This is the truck I've arranged to travel on. But suddenly, the owner of the cut is demanding more money. 5,000. 5,000. <laughs> he must be joking. Time to find another truck. What did Burton say about the fickle Harari's? Our intention was to mount early on Friday morning. Before noon, Sheikh Jami called upon us, advised travel on the most auspicious day, Monday, and exhorted us to patience, deprecating departure upon the Sabbath. I fear that the Sheikh's counsel was on this occasion likely to be disregarded. The people of Hara are famously fickle. We knew not what the morrow might bring forth from the Emir's mind. In fact, all these African cities are prisons on a large scale, into which you enter by your own will, and as the significant proverb says, you leave by another's. After hectic renegotiations, with the driver getting ever more impatient, I finally got my lift. Suddenly, my weakness and sickness left me. So potent a drug is joy. And as we passed the gates, loudly salaaming to the warders, a weight of care and anxiety fell from me like a cloak of lead. But that wasn't the end of the story, because in fact it took me two more trucks to get me to my destination. This is certainly not the safest way to travel, but it's definitely the quickest because these trucks race at high speed across the country, getting the cut to the markets on time. For me, this is where it all started. This is the place that, in August of 1940, my father was as good as killed by a direct hit from an Italian shell. The shell passed straight through one of his close friends, Sergeant Ermokajog, uh, killing him instantly. And the shrapnel from it, as it exploded, seriously wounded my father. And to this day, he still carries with him fragments of that shell. My father was reported killed, missing in action, and he was posthumously awarded a Victoria Cross, but was in fact alive. He was tended to by some nomads who came down in the evening at the end of the battle, and it was only subsequently that he was captured by Italian forces that were passing by. Fifty years later, I also fought in this valley, but this time it was with the sons and grandsons of the Somalis who had accompanied my father. Typically, they thought it was the most natural thing in the world that as my father's son, I should be there, fighting alongside them and documenting what was happening. It was the final battle of the Liberation War that overthrew the dictator Sia Barik. When the passions of rival tribes, between whom there has been a blood...